All right, we're in the studio. It's Saturday morning. It is. How are you, my friend? I see uh, <coughs> you have a little bit of a cough there. But is I that did. Okay? I did. I I, uh, I came down with something uh, last weekend at the tail end of it, and I've been fighting it off. Uh, right. At one point, uh, I think on Tuesday, I was crying tears of blood. That wasn't a good sign. Oh, that's not a good but, sign. Uh, you need to go to a doctor immediately. I went to an exorcist. An exorcist. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's about the same for you, as same. I understand it. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was good though. But I, uh, you know, I, uh, I've been. Um, Lots of vitamin C. Okay, that's good stuff. Unfortunately, though, uh, I thought, uh, you know, I, I've been trying that Zycam and vitamin C. Yes, yeah. But I thought they were all suppositories, so it didn't go quite oh, as wait, well. Oh, wait, wait, you didn't. Oh. It didn't go quite as well as I Man, as I thought. I, you're going to have to read the instructions next time, please. Uh, well, uh, and then I, refrain off, from telling us about it, maybe. I, actually, I don't. and also I thought with suppositories, I didn't think you were supposed to take them out of the bottle. So, oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. so in terms of reading the instructions. Oh, my goodness. I don't know. <laughs> how this is going to go today uh it's uh <laughs> well that's about the way it starts every time i think pretty close to uh, how this this thing goes and it rolls but uh welcome to got therapy and uh we're going to talk about mental health we're going to talk about psychology people things that happen and speaking of of things that involve uh that area of the body asteroids Asteroids, yes, there was. Yeah, that's a very interesting idea, and you know, I, we tweet back and forth and send texts a little bit. The idea that there are uh, comets in this mm-hmm. and, and uh, asteroids in this belt. I'm trying to. Sean would get me if I uh, combine the two into the same thing. They're different, but asteroids and belts. <laughs> yeah, in the no. Kyber Belt. Okay, okay I, that, I'm not going to. Com- I'm going to try to attempt to Kyber, give, dig that's myself where out the of the comets that hole, come from. Well, that's what happens. And I think there was an article about 200 of these very large obstacles that that could come back. And it's been... um, Asteroids. Asteroids that that, uh, I think some... um, You know, by the way, I had an uncle who had a really bad case of asteroids. He he, uh, had to see a doctor about that. You see, I was, I'm, tr- I'm just trying to collect my thoughts and get this, uh, sorry, sorry. Get this sentence out. But now, you know I'm struggling with it occasionally. But the idea is that, uh, you know, some 2,700 years ago, there's some uh, scientific uh, 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 evidence to, that say that the Earth was uh, bombarded by these asteroids, and it mm-hmm. caused a lot of problems around our world. And that that may come back around again because there are 200 that are sort of targeted here. And what do we do with that? So, first of all, it's it's a um, sensational article that came out that, mm-hmm. that, that, with those headlines. That we're grabbed, all doomed. They, they we're all doomed, and we have to. Uh, that's the way they get clicks, and that's how they uh, sell materials, both for media online and in newspapers. And uh, it's one of those kind of a shocking. Things you know, it's supposed to shock a little bit and get you to read further and buy the newspaper, or buy mm-hmm. the ads from the uh, media and that kind of thing. So, I don't know what you think about that. For me, it's like, okay, I think I've heard this before, but there's a little grain of it that says, "Hey, what if this is real? Mm-hmm. Are we ready for that? Mm-hmm. Are we just sitting ducks, <laughs> sitting duck as a planet?" Well, or well, um, what do you think uh, about that? I think is Jack Van Imp. He's one of the televangelists who kept predicting sort of the end of the world and whatnot. And he would um, he did this uh, show where they would read uh, the news and they would filter it through uh, revelations and Bible verses and right, whatnot and show right, the end of the world thing. So that there is a thing about this this right. investment in the end of the world that we seem to have. Uh, you know that there's a uh, we, we are drawn to it. It's a narrative that. Uh, keeps popping up uh yes it is something about Speaking of, so you, can, you can hear that warning siren there is a warning siren in the background i don't know if everybody is <laughs> picking up on the mic but that's a uh, indication that we are at 12 noon here in mm-hmm. uh, columbus georgia in the southeast of america where it's always and, the end of the world and <laughs> where there it's the end of the world or not every every uh noon we're going to hear that siren just a test just a test. Mm-hmm. I want to say that, you know, speaking about that, just in the last week or so, I think I was out um, at a friend's house, and this thing went off right before the rains and the sort of strong winds, maybe even mm-hmm. tornado uh, warning kind of thing came through. And, and it was like, hey, this is actually working. I don't know <laughs> if everybody's paying attention to it, uh, but we do have a system to sort of protect us from this strong weather and the, with the climate change that we've um, – so much in the news we and those of us who've watched the weather we see that there are stronger storms uh more of them those kind of things happening 
So the point being that this thing warns us, it's still going off in the background right now, it warns us of impending doom. That's not the word I was looking for, but the mm-hmm. in this case, maybe some strong weather or something mm-hmm. alert that we need to be alerted to. Mm-hmm. Uh, so do the question then, if we move back to the asteroids coming in, do we have a system like that? Do we? Uh, is there anything that uh, is going to warn us and say, "Hey, you know"? Because there's been a couple of disaster movies out, I think, mm-hmm. uh, that the and, and parodies of all of that, where mm-hmm. this the end of the world, and you've got. I think there was so like, many what, times. There was one with Bruce thing. Willis, wasn't it? There, yeah. there, yes, that was one with the asteroid. Turned out he was dead the whole time. I don't. <laughs> no. Oh, that's I, a. I, I, don't sorry, remember. sorry. That's, that's no, that took me off guard. But, huh. but uh, as <laughs> usual. But, but I think what what that movie was about was they had uh, put together a plan real quick and launch a spaceship up with these cowboys who uh, went and um, destroyed the asteroid or moved it uh, out of mm-hmm. the path. So, mm-hmm. but I don't think the warning system here in town about uh, thunderstorms and tornadoes not the same as uh, asteroids coming toward Earth. 200 on the list so i'm not sure we're ready are we ready is anybody doing anything somebody needs to research this well see, as you know when, when you sent that to me my first thought was you know uh, as always what would freud say you know really that's right what we gotta, <laughs> i know i gotta go with this it's a habit <laughs> so so you know that's why i was saying this notion of investment and that we may want to think about this in terms of how doomsday scenarios and doomsday narratives they have a um they have a, a, a place in our libidinal economy. There is something oh, that we like okay. to, you know, we, the, the, they are, um, we uh, consume dystopian future novels. We, uh, that there is yes. a long history of, of, you know, the earth being destroyed. Uh, there's even a TV show, I think, that um, you, you could, I, th- I think it's still going on, or maybe it's being rebooted, where um, what would the world look like if man were gone? And they right. sort of show you areas that you know what it would look like if we suddenly disappeared. And right, I've seen, I think I've seen many of those actually, <clears throat> um, a number of those movies anyway. The, it seems like the plants uh, start growing over the <laughs> concrete and the buildings, and everything looks like a lush jungle again. And uh, it's all kind of positive from a nature point of view and other kind of things. Well, we, we we do seem to be causing some trouble. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> Evidently, so, we uh, have. Yeah, don't want to admit it too much in yeah, certain groups, but just, uh, if you look at all the uh, barbecued koalas in the last couple of weeks, oh, I just ask. Uh, devastating. That's not a. Uh, not <laughs> no, I hope we don't have too many of those pictures, but I'm sure somebody has to document but, things. But it, it, it's yeah. bad. But the um, the thing that we want to ask ourselves is is um, what makes these narratives enticing. And, and not to divorce them from reality, asteroids or things have hit the Earth in the past and have certainly caused some changes and all that sort of stuff. Right. But from zombies to asteroids, there's always these narratives that we seem to invest in where the world comes to an end. And the question you might want to ask ourselves are, what itch do they scratch? What purpose do they serve um, uh, individually and collectively as a community and as a society? And... Um, one of the things that they and there are a couple ways to approach this, but if you I was I brought Jack Van Imp as up as a um, sort of an example from a Freudian perspective, they can be um, the worst kind of symptom because as long as we toy and play with the idea of the asteroid coming, it may keep us from actually acting on it. Like, okay. I wonder to what degree that they're, we're so saturated with these end of the world, these dystopian sort of future things, that they generate a sort of fantasy pocket that we sort of, uh, we find ourselves lost in, and maybe we don't do anything about them. You know, um, how many, uh, maybe we do have some sort of early warning detection system for asteroids that are coming our way, and maybe we don't, but it would be kind right. of sad that if 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 that is a potential outcome of 200 asteroids coming this way why don't we have one why do not why don't we have a something in place some kind of system that is a early warning system hey <laughs> why not? by the way i'm not sure how uh 200 is a lot 
uh, first of all, and I think uh, well, that's kind of scary because they have usually just have the one big one that's coming. If I can see on my phone every time somebody rings a doorbell in my house, I should right. be able to see a five, you should. five mile yes. asteroid. Come to think, I should of be it. able to see. You know, right? You and the Russians um, are watching what happens at your front door. I understand mm-hmm. from the all the uh, hacking that's going on with those. Well, we are systems. getting a, <laughs> a hurdy gurdy from the Ukraine, and that uh, you've that ordered might, something from the Ukraine. Okay, might, good yeah, luck that with might, that. Uh, well. <laughs> We got a we got a, a hurdy gurdy and a uh, a hand launched missile. It's uh, two well, things. Interesting because you know Ukraine was not a topic of conversation until the last year or so, and it seems like uh, <laughs> we can't can't throw a rock without hearing about the Ukraine in some way. And you are ordering, uh, okay, so. Maybe you're part of the problem here. <laughs> maybe I should. <laughs> maybe uh, you know. Maybe they're, the Ukrainians are going to save us from the asteroid. I don't know. What, maybe that's you know. What to, <laughs> I like how you tied that together. Well, it <laughs> could it could very well be. Um, I don't I don't know. Well, so our fantasy about these uh, utopian views or the zombie views, either way, I can link you. Everything's perfect, and uh, uh, versus the zombies are. You know, out to get us. Uh, we're we're uh, we're trying to avoid something maybe in this, or we're trying to kind of let's get this reality is too harsh. We talked about well, this before, but wait, I mean, well, what, well think about the reality. Like, if you want to, whenever we're taking sort of a cyclonic track, we often want to be able to ground any current experience. We want to be able to um, to follow it down some sort of early developmental thread to maybe its earliest point of origin. So you could ask yourself, what is the first asteroid? What, what is the first doomsday scenario that we're often faced with? And if you were, again, channeling Freud, yeah. um, the, there is something about the move from the, um, the ease and the rhythm of the womb into the world that suddenly confronts us with a number of asteroids. And one of the things yeah. that um, Donald Winnicott talks about this, he was a pediatrician and psychoanalyst, and one of the first potential asteroids was something like hunger which is probably something we didn't feel in the womb because of, uh, you know, we, we were, uh, uh, we had an umbilical cord that sort right. of answered these Nourishment needs. Nourishment from through the mother. So Winnicott, he reasoned that the very first catastrophe we had to deal with was hunger. And it's a catastrophe that w- came from the inside. Mm-hmm. And so um, from that moment on, we have had to work through regulation from someone else initially to be able to do something with the feelings and the, uh, the the catastrophes that we're faced with. And the infant is faced with a series of catastrophes, having to deal with yeah. hunger, gravity, all these sorts of things, uh, uh, sights, sounds, smells. You can think that uh, there's a potential for uh, more than 200 asteroids to befall <laughs> all of us at the moment of birth. And right, so okay. uh, right. uh, we, we come up with, we are assisted in the solutions we come up with. We're often helpless to the solutions we're given by caregivers earlier in that, in that point right. in our life. Thank goodness. And then we're often sort of, depending on the quality of that care, uh, we, may be, um, we may be cursed with the solutions that we're given. Okay. okay. And um, even the best caregiver doesn't arrive in time before hunger finds us. Right. So to a degree, we've all been threatened, maybe even assailed by some sort of asteroid, of, uh, a metaphorical asteroid of sorts. And so a Freudian take on this is that in some ways, every time we dance with dystopian things, uh, uh, art, literature that moves in that direction, or even news, it's a way of, um, of, of engaging once again in the very thing that um, we were uh, experienced early on and that there is something in that dance that is um, allows us to have some mastery over it okay and that's also what can make it dangerous to have the sort of um, not only is it the boy who cried wolf but in some in some respects it may be enough for us many of us simply to be scared by these headlines that we don't do anything else with them, if that makes any sense. There's a way we don't do anything with right, them. and because we're simply using them as a way to sort of um, to re-experience and remaster 
uh, something that's already happened as opposed to something that's potentially in the future. Right. Or, like some, it's something at a low level, too, that it's a headline in an article. I can dismiss that <laughs> and not look at it and uh, and laugh at it or uh, have another reaction, but I don't really delve into it. I don't connect it to some of the earlier traumas. So it seems to me like, uh, and this is the theme with the, the Freudian ideas that you've talked about so many times, but the, the idea is there's something in the past that um, that the everyday experience we have now at whatever developmental stage we're at that connects to this early, early past, yeah. and um, it's a trauma and those kind of things. So There are always elements of our history that rise up to meet the present. We never face the present moment without these filters, not just filters, because in some ways that, that's the difference between perception and apperception. Mm. We engage in a way that helps create the things that arrive, and in this act of creating the moment, we are um, bound by the tools we bring to that moment, and those are those are forged in the past, and they're often unconscious. They're forged at key developmental moments. Um, I was having a conversation with uh, um, someone about. Um, uh, uh, just sexuality in general. And you can think mm-hmm. of that, you know, that, that that is, Freud would have that begin at the very beginning, but it's certainly something that begins to arrive um, when people be at, begin to hit um, adolescence. And you could, at every developmental period, there's a different asteroid of sorts. You know, there is the, uh, the, uh, at, the at infancy, it may be the, the, uh, the asteroid of feeding and then as we move into adolescence, it may be the uh, asteroid of integrating sexuality in a way that we haven't had to before. When we hit middle age, I was talking to someone uh, also this weekend, talking about how something unique happens at middle age. You can't go backwards. There is no home to return to. But there's no clear future either. So what happens at middle age is you're often marooned in a way in between two points. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's an asteroid there. There's something that is that is um, that is potentially catastrophic that we have to find some way to dance with. And some of us are lucky enough to have been given the tools early on um, to be able to meet that in a certain way. And we also may have a context that allows us to meet that. We've talked in here before about mm-hmm. how all the things that we have to deal with, particularly through emotional regulation and whatnot, there is auto-regulation and dyadic regulation. And we always need others to some degree. You right. know? You can think of the uh, what, what's that Tom Hanks movie, the one um, um, where he had the beach ball. What's that? Uh? Uh, no, okay. First of all, it was Castaway. Second, it was not a beach ball. It was a uh, volleyball. Fo- okay, so okay, okay, okay. okay no, volleyball. Correct the record. Okay, good, good. All right. So it's a volleyball. Sorry. One of the volleyballs. You'll notice one of the first things he did was to create something he could have an interaction with. So in some right. ways, he sort of generated an object relations. There could be some element of diet or regulation. There could be, you know. Yeah. And so um, all of us, we, we, we have to be able to do that. And um, I don't think we always associate it with something earlier in our life. I mean, I, obviously, the, the, uh, the, the, the Freudian theory and, and uh, all those associated have this idea that there was, you can trace it back to something there and connect it with what you said earlier, this, uh, what's happening in the now, connecting with that. Uh, but I'm not sure that we always – average joe on the street we're connecting it to something it's usually in this moment right in front of us in the mm-hmm. here now as opposed to being connected although hmm, the theory seems to make sense that it is connected to something earlier well it's connected in the sense that the uh, the brain and the uh, the 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 nervous system of the individual facing the present moment has a history and our nervous system is 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 directed and built and bound particularly through early experiences. I and mean, there's the dance between nature and nurture, that is to say that it is uh, uh, nature through nurture. So we are, uh, the nervous system we have is, is dependent on um, the uh, developmental seas we swim in from the very beginning. And so in that way we're bound by it. You know, like, and right. It seems like if you've had a really rough <laughs> upbringing, child abuse or uh, neglect or any of those kind of things, it's actually really going to affect you more so if you had a sort of a normal average kind of upbringing with enough love and nurturing care, then you have some platform to deal with these 
a crisis to come, the asteroids to come, so mm-hmm. to speak. And, you know, you you have uh, – we've talked in here before about that guy Beyond, by the way. Yeah. And um, like the, this notion that, you know, Beyond said that um, um, all change is heralded by a catastrophe. And, and this, this makes a certain sort of, sort of sense if you think it just from the, the idea of, of learning theory, that um, – the move from uh, the big leap of faith in, 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 in learning is to have to lose something, cognitive dissonance, challenge, struggle, all these sorts of things. So there's some minor catastrophe in every time we learn something big, mm-hmm. something that informs mm-hmm. us in a way and challenges the way we think about ourselves in the world. There's a catastrophe in that. And that is that requires a level of emotional regulation, how to be able to manage and to be able to meet suffering where you're at. All these things are important. And if you can't, you not only do you not learn, not only are you stuck, but you also may be um, ill prepared when the asteroid hits. Right. You have you, you don't have the resources necessary at that moment. Uh, you may regress. I guess that's a term that's uh, sometimes used in this way, so that you're you're uh, you you're, you don't have the resources, but you're you're going to try to do something to offset this trauma that's coming. It's interesting because you mentioned the word regression, and there's a, a neuroscientist uh, and neuroscientific researcher called Alan Shore, and he he wants to sort of revive this notion of therapeutic regression, right? Because he thinks that. That's how real learning with a capital L occurs. It requires some form of, of, um, of helplessness. It doesn't mean you have to become a baby again. Right. But it's regressed in the sense that someone develops a level of dependency, a level of uh, dysregulation, and that um, that's what could make therapy very, very powerful and important. Uh, it's also a criticism. He, he pulls from some of this data, and I've seen it. There's been some increasing criticism, particularly of CBT treatments, and their um, uh, their focus mainly on on cognition. Even though DBT and stuff are now focusing more on emotional regulation, but mm. they're often very short-term type treatments, and um, the symptom recidivism and and the resurgence of of symptoms, all that sort of stuff, after six months of treatment, are um, are, are pretty. Pretty bad, you know. There's right. no okay. Whereas longer term treatments, particularly in this case, it would be psychoanalytic ones, where there is a uh, a guided and contained. Uh, there is the um, a generation of some level of dependency, and that this allows for the sort of changes that can be internalized, and that nervous system that's going to face the present is now changed and altered as a result of that in a way that briefer treatments may not allow it to happen. Right. And Shore sort of credits this notion of creating a space that where regression is possible. Regression is possible. It becomes almost a part of how to get better or work through <laughs> mm-hmm. the issue that you have. Well, it's kind of it's kind of interesting that we uh, categorize some of these things. I mean, I, I think with the – and we talked about this on other shows, but there's just a flood of information and media and everything. Information is coming at us so much and our – our brain is not quite ready for some of the technology and things that are happening, but the notion that that we have to sort of categorize the traumas. Though 200 asteroids coming at Earth, uh, I haven't heard much else besides this uh, particular article, so I can dismiss that. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I'm the person that that hits and they say, wow, here's the end of the world again. This time I believe it. So I don't know. How, people have to sort of almost like a choice of how you respond. I don't know if that's a choice or not. What do you think? Well, well I don't – the uh, the initial affective response is not a choice. Right. There, There is a feeling that arrives. The choice may occur and, you know, there's, there's a real – even this notion of free will becomes really pro- problematic when you begin to think about it in terms of what actually happens when we, make, when we appear to choose and then initiate action or behavior. Uh, there's a lot more complicated things going on in there. And, that, um, <laughs> and so I suspect that to individuals who already have um, a propensity for anxiety, 
this article may make them more anxious. It may um, it may already fuel an obsessive, ruminative element of them that you know they are already dwelling on. Uh, okay. On the yeah. End of this, this, this. Yeah. In this way, I, I just had uh, a thought of one of our other episodes about confirmation bias. That you hear if you're anxious, you hear something that makes you more anxious. You tend to spend more time and believe it, and that kind of, those kind of things. So uh, that could very well trigger some of that that you already had in motion in some ways. Yeah, and you, next thing you know, you got like uh, you're buying like um, uh, half a ton of peanut butter and storing it in your basement. <laughs> right, right. See, yeah, you build it. You're building the shelter, but I think if the big asteroids are coming, the shelter may not help. I don't know, but uh, something that something to think I don't about. Know, all, yeah, all you buy in bulk is, is what you're saying. I, I got enough peanut butter to last me for a couple hundred years. <laughs> Just saying, and I got a peanut allergy, so. Really oh, be, oh you know, well, that that even be. That complicates it even more. <laughs> really, you know, not sure why you're making that purchase, yeah. but uh, yeah, well, you got to work through that allergy so you yeah. can actually use that peanut butter. Yeah, I had, <laughs> I had a friend tell me the only way I was ever going to get swole is due to allergies. So you know, uh, swole. <laughs> Well, that's you know. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, that, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry, was, sorry. I, I was thinking that that was a. <laughs> it's not a, you know. Uh, somewhere between woke and swole, maybe I don't know. <laughs> it's but. not a slow woke. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, uh, um, I didn't say it a minute ago, but I, I am. Um, when you mentioned like uh, how the our childhood affects us, you know, I didn't. You don't know if you realize this, but I was I was raised by a cat, and to this day, I'm only attracted to women who have eight breasts. Oh, <laughs> that was. Uh, <laughs> That was uh, a bit of information that we really didn't need to hear about. But um, I, there's something wrong. But I'm not sure being raised by the cat was was what it what the uh, what the problem was. Well, I don't I don't know. I, I, there's this like I said. There's just so much information out there, and we have this childhood that sort of led us to. Uh, the the personality that we are now in some ways, as we talked about, and then um, we have to deal with these constant threats uh, to ourselves and to other things uh, in our in a context that uh, we're not really sure how to uh, to respond, at least in a in a uh, in a in a uh, emotional way, because maybe we don't have the uh, the ability to control that so much, but. I don't know. I, I, the the issue of these news headlines and what's going on, well, well, it's almost a numbing kind of a well, response. Well, you're the one that sent me that sent me this thing. So, what did it do to you? You you saw this thing. What what you know? Did you yeah, suddenly? Well, uh, did you go buy the uh, peanut butter in bulk? What, what did all right, you do? No, here's 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 what I I do typically. I don't know, but uh, I want to say there's a pattern here or not. But so I'm scrolling through the Twitter. Which I uh, subscribe to a certain group of folks that send information out. Some funny and humorous. Mm-hmm. Others are more newsy and and uh, hopefully uh, helpful and educational. So the first response is, okay, look at this sensational uh, headline. They're trying to sell papers or website mm-hmm. uh, advertisements or something. And then if it's if it hits a level where I go, mm, I wonder what's what's behind that, and I'll start looking in. So I'll go to the article and start reading who mm-hmm. it's about, wh- who said this, what's the evidence there for. I'm looking for something to sort of verify uh, and this you, you is being up, real. You call right? up the cruise and ask him if he knows anything about these well, asteroids. Well, I need to. I really need to because, uh, as we know, Sean Cruz and the Cruz uh, has all the information you about know. this. I mean, that's what he studies, yeah. right? So. I think he had asteroids once, too. Oh, I don't know. I don't know how to <laughs> respond to that. He knows about them. <laughs> but uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah, I want to read the article. It turns out it was on a podcast. Somebody was talking about this. This is actually the uh, author, and I'll put the name up, but the, the author um, had, had – uh, is a person of uh, a scientist and looks at mm-hmm. this uh, anthropology, looks at all of the history and and so forth. And there were some legitimate concerns that we're not prepared was the bottom line in, in mm-hmm. all of this, and we need to do something. NASA mm-hmm. has done a lot of things, and that there was a, sort of a hint that there was something going on to uh, detect these things, but prepare for. I'm not sure that's really moving very fast. So. Uh, that's what I did in response to your you, you the answer tried to answer your question w- was that I dug deeper into it to see if it 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 w- hit the level of something I could believe I uh, did it know, enough evidence there 
So you said, well, you, you, you went and you looked, you wanted to educate yourself, so yeah. you responded. It generated uh, enough of an emotional experience or uh, an affective state that at least engendered curiosity. So you invested, you looked into it a bit more. Yes. It's not quite, uh, not not quite all of it. Let me just mm-hmm. add a couple more things. That th- it was a picture, so uh, it was a graphic representation of these uh, multiple asteroids just out of the Earth's atmosphere, mm-hmm. about to hit the planet. Mm-hmm. That was the first thing. So uh, it's a visual that I respond to at the very beginning before I read the headline. So I had to I had to put that in there because I think mm-hmm. that's another sensory piece that uh, there was a visual you, you, there was a drawing of an asteroid about to uh, decimate the planet exactly yeah that's yeah. Uh, that that started the whole thing so was, it, it started with a visual mm-hmm. and it, that often happens with me I'm, I'm kind of well, well there's something and mm-hmm. what is that about let me read the headlines mm-hmm. and go on if so if I want to be honest that's how it actually happens so as a visual generated some experience you were able to turn that experience into curiosity you were able to explore it and at the end of this, you concluded what? I concluded it might be a topic for us to talk about in that um, what's others' reaction to this? Is mm-hmm. it like mine? Do people, like you said earlier, they just kind of – they had this anxiety already. It just <laughs> adds to it. It feeds in there, and they go uh, bonkers and, uh, and start doomsday – Doomsday prepping of some sort, like you with the peanut butter, right? And Giant cans or, of peanut butter, or or what? I mean, is it taken? Is it should it be just dismissed by uh, because it's another sensational headline and it mm-hmm. and it doesn't have anything in, yeah. uh, to support it? Uh-huh. Well, and in that, in a way, so so it sounds like for you that the jury may be out. That you will continue to if more right. information shows up, then you might go out and buy the peanut butter, or. Um, right. Um, or be more concerned uh, to a certain extent and find out what, uh, all right, the United States, great country, got a lot of material wealth. Have we done anything about this? Got a lot of this? peanut butter. <laughs> we make Wait. peanut butter here and not far from here, by the <laughs> way. And so, uh, yeah, are we really, uh, you know, what's uh, what's the percentage that this thing is going to happen? And if it does cr- cross, cross a threshold of some sort, then – do we have ways to do it now? In the in the article, it also um, talked about that just a little bit that uh, you don't want to bomb these things and blow them up like a nuclear weapon. They're going to blow things up into tiny pieces that still have the same terrible outcome. Yeah. And impact. you just got lots of things hitting you. Yeah, lots as opposed to the big one. And so uh, they said you you have to do something of by the way of putting a rocket or something. Uh, mm-hmm. That land on it or get close to it to move it, move move its path out of the way, mm-hmm. and that's a possibility. But on this one, you have to do it 200 times, so I'm still mm-hmm. not sure. But at least it gave you that information to so sort of move work it with. out of the way. You yeah, might be just wanted to, you know. Yeah, all these things are some in some sort of orbit mm-hmm. uh, as the uh, as the, the solar system is in the way. I think Sean talked about. Accretion, I believe it was, or something—the forming of planets and the uh-huh. and the solar system—that this is something that sort of spins and circles and uh, comes together. That uh, perhaps we can look at the path of this these two hundred comets or asteroids and be able to do something with all of that. Uh-huh. I'm but, not sure. I, I'm not uh, like I said. The evidence uh, <coughs> gives us a little information. I'm not convinced at this mm-hmm. point. But notice how that you know. Your narrative took you to this place where you're still sort of in a, actively seeking information to determine mm-hmm. what you may need to do with this. Yeah. But you can see how, and in some ways, you were prepared to be able to do that. Other right. individuals, maybe because of um, their earlier developmental asteroids, the catastrophe that, that they've had to face, they may come up with a different solution. Some of them may be frozen by this. They may disavow it. They may simply, you know... We see that, I think, with a lot of, when you mentioned climate change and whatnot, there's there's sort of a uh, individual and societal attempt at disavow. We just ignore it, right? That's one. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's the possibility of overreaction. When you mentioned the idea of sending, trying to blow up the asteroids and make it worse, right. there are lots of ways yep. we could make this worse. Right? Oh, uh, yeah. It could. And then there, there then there's the, uh, the flight of terror. And I was sort of joking about the peanut butter, but... That's also a way, in some ways, not to deal with this in the way that we possibly could. 
because if it turned out that there was an asteroid coming our way that we had no control over and there's a good chance it was going to wipe out most of the planet, then we would need to know that and be able to act accordingly. Right. What can we save? What could we do? We would need to be able to have the experience, become aware of it, and then do something with it, which in some ways is that th- those are the three stages of any sort of emotional regulation, right? Right. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. <clears throat> we have to do something with it. Mm-hmm. And if we, if we don't do something with it, it figuratively and literally does something to us. And um, whether it is the asteroids, one of the 200 heading our way, or the asteroid of Monday – or uh, <laughs> any sort of emotional event you're currently, the conflict you continually have with a, a, a spouse or a significant other, each of those, there's the potential for a narrative that can move you in the place of doing something with it or one that can move you in one of those other places. And, and there's the model of, you know, of, of, of fight, flight, or freeze. There is the, um, the, the disavowal, the uh, being paralyzed, there is the running away, uh, active avoidance, and then there's the overreaction, right? Mm-hmm. And so we we, we got to find to be able to to navigate those three those those three points. We have to get to a place that you're describing. Well, where we will use this to gather more information, right? To do. Yeah, that, it, it does make sense, and it seems like some sometimes we're overwhelmed by the emotion, and we just stay in that state. Uh, uh, of agitation and anxiety or fear, mm-hmm. which is a big part of this <clears throat> this kind of a headline, uh, the fear. What are you going to do? And then it then it leads you to go back, and then we'll full circle a little bit back to uh, some of those movies and some of those things that we in the books and writing and movies and media that that. Uh, that it's going to be a terrible outcome, and we're going to see how these things are working out. It fits in with conspiracy theories as well. But it, but then then there's uh, okay, reasonable, rational. How should we deal with this information that we have, and what can we do? What are the possibilities? Mm-hmm. And let's uh, choose a path and and uh, see if that helps us out. But there's all this, these people who just uh, have really a lot of trouble with that emotional regulation. Mm-hmm. The systemic window, as we talked about yeah. so many times. And sometimes they get to be president. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Knew we couldn't go far, but hey, that's all right. Uh, things are uh, things are going to happen. We're in the countdown year now uh, for elections and that kind of thing. So maybe we'll see. We may have a few more asteroids heading our way there. <laughs> I don't know. Lots of asteroids. Seems to be the most engaged, talked about topic, too. Asteroids or the current election or the election cycle? Well, the way you combined okay. both of those together, I that's was thinking, right, that's they, yeah, the impending they, doom or um, something happening here. So it's it's it's. I don't think it's impending. I think it's what it's it's, it's tended. <laughs> it's, it's what is it? Yeah. <laughs> what is what's the well, opposite? I, of? I don't know. It's it's uh, <laughs> it's already happened. It's there. It, <clears throat> it's there it's, for uh, us. It, it's been pending. Yeah. So I don't know. We just have to deal with the. Um, <laughs> I mean, this was an example of uh, probably a million of these kinds of things from the the media and the headlines trying to grab your attention. They're trying to shock you. Mm-hmm. They're trying to, you know, frighten you. Fear seems to be a big seller in so many ways. And if you're talking about politics, that's certainly a part of what's happened there. But it uh, fear sells. Mm-hmm. Well, there's several things to think about that. You mentioned that the notion of the euthymic window. There are a way in which we. We look for things that'll that'll get us just at the top part of that euthymic window. Horror movies, uh, news stories that are you know gloom and doom. There's a way we we get you a certain level of pleasure that it we actively seek out so those sorts of things because in a way they balance us. They they we want to pull ourselves up into the 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 places of fear a little like um, a roller coaster ride yeah and so we're often looking for things that will generate those sorts of experiences for us and um, that's kind of what I was meaning earlier that there's a way we can be trapped by that that sometimes this constant flow of of horrible things actually j- drives us to inaction because it simply fulfills the purpose of maintaining some sort of balance. It doesn't trigger action. It's just right. we keep looking at these things and we we keep you know. Uh, and you also mentioned this notion that you know that it plays a part in politics and um, oftentimes that you know a political opponent will will attempt to make the other opponent look more dangerous than the other. 
Right. And and there's some indication that under fear, for instance, um, I think this was it Drew Weston who did this study, or maybe you just mentioned it, but that um, we will lean more conservative when we're afraid. And there's there's something about these broad political categories that correlate with um, uh, neurological states and uh, categories of emotional regulation. Mm-hmm. When we move into places where we're more where we're more afraid, we're going to um, we're going to want order. We're going to want structure. We're going to want certainty. We're going to and and um, that pulls for more conservative ideology. Mm-hmm. If mm-hmm. if liberal ideology is much more marked by the openness to experience and things like that, those diminish when we're afraid. So you'll often see, and, and, and I think there's some research on this, that particularly when it comes to um, Republican candidates who tend to be on the right, they tend to lean more toward, you know, they're t- going to take your guns, uh, they're going to kick in your door, um, people are going to come over the border and, you know, and uh, attack your cat. Um, there are all these sorts of things that you get, and uh, they are a surefire way to either motivate a certain base, right. but it also may pull other people in the direction you want them to because when they're afraid, they move in that direction. Right, right. And and it's a collective in a way, right? I mean, you move that group in there, almost sounds like we have the same ideas in this group. Uh, <coughs> sounds a little socialist uh, to me. So uh, <laughs> it, uh, that, that, that's gets a, some the people reverse afraid. of everything there. <laughs> that, gets, that gets some people afraid. Well, when you think about it, this, this notion of uh, individuality, particularly if, if you look at it a more conservative way of thinking about individuality, if there's this notion of the individual versus the collective, and somehow on the left it's much more collective and on the right it's much more. But there's, there, is, um, um, there is a tribalism that drives conservative politics mm-hmm. that is in some ways anti-individual. Yeah, that's, I nations. think yeah, that's what was a, a very, very. Yeah, it's group. not. Uh, you are free to choose to be a straight Christian uh, who you know who uh, likes chicken. Uh, and, they're, they're, they're and, the, <laughs> and guns. And guns. <laughs> Whereas you know, and if you don't choose those things, you 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 are outside the tribe, and that you are um, you could be potentially suspicious. So. Uh, that that makes sense to me. You know this binary world that we're in with the tribalism and so forth, the ones and zeros, uh, it just seems like, and I may be hopeful about this, but I think the vast majority of people are somewhere between those two, uh, and all we see in the media are the fringes uh, uh, of that uh, continuum. So I'm hopeful about that, that maybe we we can learn to balance these things out in some way. Well, the future will uh, let us know about that as well. Oh, there's not going to be a future because the asteroids are coming. So, oh, yeah. That's so right. We're, we're, I, yeah, I'm sorry to mention that, uh, but bring that up. But I don't know. Uh, we've, we've worked through a lot of things, but I don't think we have control over what happens in the solar system and the universe and uh, some planet. Uh, you know, they maybe, talk. Maybe the crew so does. Ways. Maybe Sean does. If we ask this guy, he may, he may have some answers. <laughs> You know. Yeah, he does. As a matter yeah. of fact, in that. So, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, defer to his uh, expertise in in all of this. But, but uh, yeah. So we have to respond to this. But that's just one headline out of, as I said before, a million. And there are probably worse headlines. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Right. That this one was okay. Kind of benign in a way that it just happened to pop up, and there was a nice picture. And I'll pull a graphic up here, but. Uh, all right, it gets you thinking about it, and also it's a diversion from the day-to-day grind of all the other things that are goes driving that, you crazy. Maybe that euthymic window, you 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 will seek out a certain level of stimuli because um, uh, a level of excitation allows you to return to that placid normal. And you're right, there is a grind in that. We we want to be scared, we want to be sad. The movies we watch do either one of those things. You know, there's. Uh, old Yeller dies at the end. I don't hope I didn't give that away. Oh, too and, late. Uh, too late. You know, and, and, and that's that bottom part of that euthymic window. And then we watch, you know, some guy with a chainsaw. That's on the other end of that. And so we, right. we, we gravitate, you know, toward. Uh, and then there's some movies like that movie, The Lighthouse. It seemed to, yeah. you know, yeah. just. 
I don't know what you're ways. talking about. I've, I've actually blocked that entire <laughs> so experience out, yes. so I don't know. Is that a, something I should see? Should Maybe. See. Uh, all right. <laughs> it's up for an award. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. We, well, we saw it win. Hey, here's one of the take. Here's, this would be a takeaway from this. All right. I, I think the way to think about this is, is that we should um, we shouldn't just look to the sky for asteroids. We should look for the ones that are arriving on Monday morning when we wake up. Mm. We should look yeah. for all the things that dysregulate us with the potential for being able to be changed by them. We often are not in ways that we should. Right. And so our capacity for that to, to, be, uh, to accept and to become aware and then do something with those things we feel, those, those steps could be necessary. So my worry isn't as much because if there are asteroids coming, it'll depend on our ability to be able to do something with the feelings that their shadows give, not when, because by the time they hit, it's too late. Right. And that requires our ability to do something with our feelings. And I think again and again and again, that's something that we need to work on. I'm, I'm with you on that. I don't think we spend enough time processing and really the self-reflection and you know weighing things as opposed <laughs> to just taking an opinion and being in the group maybe, mm-hmm. and it feels good to be in the group and everybody seems to think alike. Mm-hmm. That's not true, but you, you, you conjure that up. and So maybe it's this uh, deliberation and uh, questioning things mm-hmm. a little bit. Maybe some critical thinking in there might be helpful. Maybe critical thinking, critical feeling. I think that's important. Okay. Also, right. the, the other thing is to think about too. There's something that we we, we got to discuss before before we go. All right. My favorite band in the world. Yes. Their new album came out last night. Okay. Wire and the name of the uh, the band is Wire and the album is Hive Mind. Hive. And let me mind. just say. All right. You got to right. you got to listen to this thing. These guys have been okay. together since technically '76. Their first album came out in '77, and um, wow. Uh, one of the reviews I read, they've never made a bad album. And I think you, wow. uh, you know, well, they've only made two. But okay, okay no. <laughs> no, no. That's, well, uh, uh, you know, wh- how does this happen? <laughs> that the, this is the band you love, and I know you've talked about them. You've been to their yeah. concerts. You can't. Wait I'm going to be the seeing them one. in March. Yeah, I knew, knew that was happening. And so here's the thing: uh, why aren't they known? Uh, more widely. I mean, Here's what's, the thing. what's going on here? There was a famous saying, I think it was Grail Marcus said that when the Velvet Underground released their first album, five thousand only five thousand or five hundred copies were sold, but everybody who bought one formed a band. Wire are tremendously influential. If you listen okay. to um, mm-hmm. uh, the band REM were influenced by Wire. Um, um, uh, lots of new wave bands, uh, David Bowie uh um, was uh, took took some wireisms with him. Um, their uh, first album, Pink Flag, is usually when people list the top fifty albums, rock albums of all time. It's usually in there somewhere. Okay. Okay. So right. th- they're they're a band that, um, and I think probably why they wouldn't be known is is they are they're too odd. Okay. And they're too arty and weird. Yep. To really be mass consumed. Okay. So people get right. they take elements. Uh, in fact, there's even a thing called a, if you'll re- listen to reviews, particularly of indie bands, they'll often say, "Well, this band sounds like Wire," or this said, "This is a you can you know Wirey." So right. that there's even like a a genre, they become like you know how certain directors like if it's Fellini, Fellini esque, or you know all that sort of right, right, or uh, Spielberg esque, whatever. They've become an adjective. Yes. So yes, you're right. They, they, do. don't, they don't have mass consumption, but they've managed to find a way to uh, to embed themselves into our discourse. They've they've changed the course of the symbolic order in their own way, and that in of itself is an achievement, I think. All right, my friend, uh, you are definitely a fan. So, um, yeah, and people listen to this. Hey, go go listen to Wire. Go pick up the uh, Hive Mind. It's good. It's good. Hive Mind. It's not an album, is it? It's an album. They still call it albums I mean, these days and <laughs> well, times. Can, I mean, the now vinyl that vinyl thing. is back. Vinyl is back so is you can get you can buy an album i unfortunately was streaming it last night before i went to bed and you know and so uh I, <laughs> okay if, it's good to hear that you've made cold, that move up there to the, streaming all right well, good. If the cold doesn't kill me i'll yes. listen to it again today but i'm probably after this gonna go crawl into a ball and take a nap <laughs> sounds me. like a good thing to do and and listen you need to take care of yourself because mm. that that's an this Speaking. cold is an asteroid coming for you yeah, this is so an asteroid, do something right. with that 
All right, final words. Um, what else is going on? Anything else we need to know? Oh, you're doing a talk coming up. I am. Um, I'm really interested in that. There's a group that's actually going to form and sit in a room and listen to you. There is. There so is. this is going to be uh, fun. All right, give us a little bit of the topic and where it's are you going to go with this thing? It's at St. Simon Sounds. I'll be, I'll be giving a talk on ethics. Ethics? Ethics. Okay, my friend. I know you very well, and uh, somebody <laughs> needs to be there to help you uh, <laughs> figure out what the ethics really are yeah, before you that, say something a, unethical. That, that's okay, a little I'm like a, a Catholic priest doing a talk on sex, really. Oh, it's kind of like the same thing. It's like this, you know, there. He's, uh, yeah. he's probably heard of ethics and seen pictures, but maybe not really ever <laughs> engaged in any... I um, I'm hoping it goes well. And uh, before you go, take a look at the code of ethics somewhere. Just pick one up. I'll, I'll tell you what. Somewhere. I got it tattooed. I'm not gonna tell you where, but I can make it dance. That's all that you need to know. <laughs> That's way too much information. And we're, on that note, uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>